Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Shaping Culture Through Play, How the Magic Circle Can Help Us Build Better Democracies. I'd like to welcome Wei Li to the stage to begin our session. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to welcome the Radical Exchange community today to discuss how uh, play uh, could be a source of insight for the material world. And um, I'd like to introduce Peter. Uh, they, they are an independent game designer and artist. Peter works towards the deconstruction of the white supremacist capitalist heteropatriarchy. Their works include the critical acclaimed game Perfect Woman, which satires societal expectations for women by playfully mapping this concept to inaccurate and unsuccessful Xbox Connect motion controls. Um, I'm excited to see what uh, you have to share today, Peter. Uh, thank you, Whaley. I'm gonna just go ahead and get started with the presentation then. All right. Okay, so the title of my talk today is Shaping Culture Through Play, How the Magic Circle Can Help Us Build a Better Democracy. So this presentation is going to happen in two parts. Uh, the first one is largely based off an essay I wrote for the RxC blog a while ago um, um, as an accumulation of my experience uh, working in blockchain. Uh, before that, I was a game designer, uh, and it's on real-centric blockchain games as playgrounds for radical markets. Uh, and the second part, uh, so the first part will be very pragmatic. Um, and the second part will kind of build a broader theory around play and democracy or play and culture. Uh, so it's titled Shaping Culture Through Play. And hopefully at the end, I'll sort of be able to bridge the two parts together. All right, so um, uh, <laughs> uh, the title of this first half is Real Centric Blockchain Games as Playgrounds for Radical Markets. So what are real centric video games? Um, real centric is a term that I, I made up um, to, it's a real centric design, emphasizes game mechanics that create a dynamic and interesting world rather than game mechanics that serve the player experience. So I think this is best explained through some examples um, and just think in terms of video games that you have played. Uh, on the left, we have player centric mechanics. On the right, we have sort of real centric equivalents of them. So a player-centric mechanic uh, in a massively multiplayer online game might be something like replenishing resources. This way, all players are able to uh, come in and, and um, you know, get the resources, level up their characters, and repeat that cycle. Uh, whereas in a real-centric game, you might have finite resources, and scarcity becomes a source of conflict in the game instead. Uh, a player-centric mechanic is player respawn to give continuity to your character if your game features ways for your character to die. Um, it's very common just to respawn your character and you keep all your stuff. Whereas in a real-centric game, you might have permanent death. Uh, so you, once your character dies, it's over. You have to start over with a totally uh, new character. This is very popular in like the roguelike genres and survival games. There are also some fun experimental indie games that simply don't let you play the game anymore once you lose. Uh, a player-centric mechanic might be something like teleportation, which allows you to travel anywhere in the world so that you can join your friends in a multiplayer game, for example, whereas a real-centric game would require you to walk or somehow uh, travel um, without teleportation. And uh, that has you know, big consequences in terms of who can interact with each other and uh, how resources uh, travel across the world. And then finally, what's probably most relevant to what I'm about to present is a marketplace, uh, NPC, non-player controlled marketplaces with fixed prices in a player-centric game. You need an item, you enter a shop that's run by an AI and you can buy an item at a fixed price, sell an item that you, uh, that you don't want at a fixed price. Whereas in a real-centric game, you have player-run marketplaces with dynamic economies. Um, all buy and sells are done by the players and uh, the, the developers don't have much control in terms of uh, what gets sold and for how much. Okay, so, so why world-centric? Um, well, world-centric games, uh, they create more space for emergent play. Um, players have the agency to shape their own experience. It's no longer being defined by the developers. The players have to create their own experience with each other using the building blocks that a real-centric game provides. Um, 
And as, as we know, games are largely based on real world, uh, real world settings. They take from culture uh, all over the place. So why not also base them on real world mechanics too? Um, and if you're interested about this in particular, I wrote an essay a while back uh, called World-Centric Massively Multiplayer Online Game Design, and that was really the starting point for a lot of the ideas that I'm, uh, that I'm going to be sharing here. But most importantly, <laughs> world-centric video games can serve as playgrounds for radical markets. So why use games as playgrounds for radical markets? Um, first of all, they're safe whatever happens in the game only affects consenting players within the game. And so we see it's you know, very difficult and challenging to do um, and dangerous potentially to do these experiments in the real world. For example, when, uh, you know, when earlier the uh, US was trying to expand their, their neoliberal democratic governments to, to third world countries that had pretty disastrous effects, right? And that was a group of, of male economists um, privileged economists who uh, had never tried anything like this before. And that was very dangerous to try in the real, right? But we can already, there are already um, hyper-capitalistic uh, game economies that can, that can play test these things that are going on right now, albeit that's a little, happening a little bit too late. Uh, they're precise. So game databases can be indexed, searched, and studied with precision, unlike real world data. They're imaginative. So there's no real world restrictions to what can and can't be done. Um, and here imaginative means not just uh, physical limitations, but also social and political ones, right? Uh, that it may be very difficult to implement something like quadratic voting in a present day system, whereas you can just go ahead and do it in a video game, who's going to stop you? Um, cons. Uh, so, so what are the downsides of doing this? Well, they do require a critical mass of players for interesting social structures to emerge. Um, you'll have briefers, trollers, hackers, etc., who will try and break the rules of the game and make it not do what it was intended to do. Developers can arbitrate, they can patch, ba uh, ban players, impose terms of service, etc., uh, reducing integrity of data. And finally, games aren't real. Um, Right, I mean, they're, they're not real. So maybe the results have limited impact on what you can bring into uh, the real world. Uh, just to go back one point on um, when I, uh, <laughs> where I said integrity, uh, here I'm going to, I'm pretending to be an economist when I say integrity. Um, and in fact, uh, developer arbitration might even be a better model of a socialist democracy with a large government, for example. But the purpose of this talk is really focusing on the economist version of data integrity. And the second half will maybe broaden that to other, other kind of other ideas of what uh, good data might be. So now we'll apply blockchain and um, so warning, some of the blockchains, uh, some blockchain specific stuff is coming up and I'll do my best to explain it like a normal person. Uh, and like many of the ideas behind radical exchange, blockchain is just an opportunity and platform to enable them. Uh, it is not an ideology. So let's just keep that in mind as we go forward. All right, so why blockchain? That's a question any blockchain project has to sincerely answer. Now I'm not claiming that my answers are necessarily sincere, but hopefully I can do a little bit better than most of these other blockchain projects out there. Um, so code as law and decentralization limits or prevents developer arbitration. Rules are arbitrated deterministically through code. At least on paper, nobody quote unquote owns the game. And just an asterisk here, we know from experience decentralization is maybe not so well defined. Secondly, transaction fees put a fixed cost on griefing and civil attacks. So these now become legitimate forms of play. And there's an asterisk here as well. So we know from experience legitimate is not so well defined. Uh, for example, some of the uh, Ethereum hard forks and so on. And finally, token exchanges allow ex um, token exchanges allow exchange of in-game assets for real-world fiat. And the important point here is that game data is now fiat measurable. And towards the point um, earlier where I said games aren't real, well, I'll posit a claim here that maybe decentralization and this idea of fiat measurability somehow makes what's going on real, right? Um, and you can already see this in blockchain where we're sort of, mm, is it real? Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> and that's also something I'll explore more in the second half. Okay, so how do we do it? What does a world-centric blockchain look like? So um, there's kind of this handy dandy diagram here. Uh, I hope you can see my mouse. 
Um, so uh, in three steps, we have a virtual economy. So we have capital from the real world and this virtual economy is bootstrapped via an ICO uh, or maybe the value is bootstrapped through an airdrop, hype, marketing, so on, whatever be it. And then once you enter this virtual world, uh, the virtual world plays out through the actions of many different player agents and it generates its own story through competition and collaboration and you have growth in this virtual world. And then finally, this data from this virtual world, you have growth in here, stuff happens, we're able to transfer it back into the real world in the form of fiat measurable data. And maybe we can translate this data into, uh, convert this data into real world insights that will help us build better democracies. All right, so what, um, what, what radical markets can we model in uh, real-centric blockchain games? Well, frankly, the imagination is your limit. Do whatever you want, right? Uh, um, so don't let my list here be, be a, um, just uh, exclusive. But just as some examples, uh, Harbinger Tax, uh, also known as Cost or Salsa, are great, uh, can very easily uh, be implemented in a game. Same with quadratic voting and finance. Uh, a personal interest of mine is environmental markets. We already have games that sort of simulate a dynamic economy that, uh, ecology rather, uh, that players can sort of uh, extract resources for, from and harm uh, and maybe need to do some things to manage it, to maintain it, uh, to keep it sustainable. Um, outsourcing labor and risk is kind of a fun one. Uh, that's difficult to do within a single game, but remember there won't just be a single real-centric blockchain game. There may be many different real-centric blockchain games and they can connect to each other um, through you know, public APIs to allow them to outsource labor and risk to each other. Uh, this one is fun and I think a terrible idea in practice, but great to do in a, uh, in a video game is a uh, futarchy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's using prediction markets to, uh, as, <laughs> as governance uh, mechanisms. Um, and finally, data labor, uh, data labor markets, um, I, I kind of, suggest this idea, uh, this is something that Weili kind of gave me the insight for is that, you know, blockchain is kind of in a sense a data labor market, right, where we have all these people making new dApps and trying to use them and generating data on, you know, on something that sort of hasn't been done before, right, and they're getting paid in terms of the, the token valuation, I suppose. Um, all right, so, so where have we seen a real centric blockchain game before? Now I claim that in fact, we have seen a hugely successful one already. Um, what is it? Decentralized and centralized token exchanges are already examples of extremely successful real centric blockchain games. Um, and actually I'm gonna claim for any game designers out there, it's better to think of blockchain games uh, more like exchanges more like exchanges and less like what we normally think of when we think of games. So when blockchain enthusiasts believed that games would be the killer dap, they were both right and wrong. It was just not the kind of game that we were thinking of. And this makes sense, right? If we think of blockchain as a paradigm shifting technology that people claim it to be, uh, then the products we build on it should look very different than the things we're already familiar with. And towards the point of games, you know, like, all right, this is already going on. Why are we talking about games? Well, I think exchanges are unimaginative, imaginative and boring. Uh, blockchain market designs are currently largely based on existing markets. So there are a lot of missed opportunities there. Uh, and at least in the current market, an entirely fictitious use case seems at least as useful as real use cases promised by many blockchain startups. Now to help segue into the next part of the talk, I just want to point out that there's uh, much more at play here than any single exchange, right? The platform itself is dynamic. You have this entire DeFi ecosystem and this ecosystem itself plays kind of like a game where people come in and figure out what, uh, what opportunities I guess there are and try and create products to, to capitalize on those opportunities. Um, unfortunately, the whole thing is fairly uh, uh, capitalistically driven, um, but nonetheless, it's still very interesting. Um, so, so Whaley, I think uh, I am a little bit ahead of time. So maybe I can take one or two questions before I move on to the second half of the presentation. Thanks, Peter. Um, so in the audience, if you have any questions, you're welcome to uh, send them over. Um, right now, it was just a request to share the presentation. Sounds like people are 
really curious to dig in more. Um, so we can coordinate with the organizers to see if that's um, possible after to, to get out this presentation to people. Oh yeah, I'll definitely share the slides. I don't know how that's done, but I guess we'll figure it out. Um, so good. then I'll just go on to the, uh, the second part of this presentation and we'll do all the questions at the end. Sounds good. All right, so the second part of my presentation is called A Theory of Play, The Magic Circle. And on the right, I have a quote by Johann Heusenha, who wrote the book Homo Ludens um, on play and culture. And Heusenha writes, culture arises in the form of play, that it is played from the very beginning. So let's take a look at how play, um, how play relates to culture. How is culture played? And these are going to be basically some examples from Heusenha's book. Uh, Heusenha traces the history of legal proceedings in different countries, uh, sorry, in different cultures. In archaic society, trial by contest was common. Uh, now, not necessarily trial by combat, as is um, sort of most, most of us are aware of. There are many more other interesting examples that weren't by combat, such as the Inuit tradition of trial by flighting, uh, which is something that's comparable to a modern day rap battle. Now, Hoisenha points out that the truth interpretation of trial, whether it be through divine intervention or through logical conclusion, did not come until later. Uh, that is to say the play and contest aspect came first. And of course, the game-like structure of a present day court hearing is clear. The hearings take, uh, take place in a court, which is you know, an actual playing field and on this playing field, a different set of rules apply. The judge presides uh, over this playing field, donning specific attire that suggests that judge becomes a different being um, that can channel justice. And also that this transformation into another being uh, also has its roots in play. Hoisenha gives the example of agon or competition, um, which underscored Greek and Roman civilization the Panhellenic Games, which included the Olympic Games, were played to honor the Greek gods uh, and also used to measure the passage of time. In Rome, this transition to institutions like gladiatorial combat, with the majority now as spectators instead of as competitors. The relation between play and language is a deep topic. Um, so I'm only going to share uh, one area of interest of mine here, which is the performance of professionalism. So we can see this in the past with practices like chivalry and Bushido. In present day, we see this in, uh, in business practices where business people or the players dress formally and will talk the talk. And business deals are often concluded purely based off such superficial criteria. In this regard, quote unquote, doing business is both a performance and a contest. And I just wanna share a little bit about myself. Uh, the reason why a performance of professionalism is an uh, interest of mine is through my own experience deconstructing, sorry, through rather through deconstructing my own experience in becoming an engineer and how my own performance of gender played a factor in that. Um, although it's not represented in any of the uh, images here, perhaps a presentation I'll give another day. So from a linguistic and communication perspective, play can be interpreted as quote unquote, playing with signifiers, uh, what the signifiers and what they signify. Uh, and this, um, this, is, this is something that, one second. And this is something that seems intrinsic in our cognitive abilities and can even be observed in animals, uh, which is kind of amazing to me. So for example, both animals and humans will play fight where a clenched fist signifies an actual punch but is not an actual punch and that people are able to recognize this or animals are able to recognize. Uh, and in language or in the English language, we literally have the saying a play on words where we play with the fact that some words have multiple meanings and impose them uh, and kind of contrast them to each other. So in this regard, uh, modern art challenged the idea of representation and later contemporary art came in and challenged the idea of uh, art itself. So going through the examples, uh, in the bottom left, we have Matisse's painting of a pipe that is in fact not a pipe. 
And this is in fact not, a, uh, not Matisse's painting either, rather an image of Matisse's painting that's being displayed on your screen. Uh, next, we have Duchamp's urinal in the upper left, uh, which in some sense was figuratively pissing on modern art to bring in contemporary art. In regards to play, we might say modern art played with the signifier and contemporary art uh, played with what could be signified. Uh, in the bottom right, we have a piece by Murakami, uh, which plays with the boundary between popular culture in Japan and contemporary art. And in the upper right, we have a piece by Barbara Kruger, which plays with signifiers of art, advertisement, and consumer culture and its relation with our gendered bodies. So for more on play and linguistics, I highly recommend reading Gregory Bateson's essay, Theory of Play and Fantasy. Um, that essay was a starting point for a lot of the, of the lines of thought that I'm sharing here. All right, let's look at the, um, let's look at it going in the other direction. Culture, how does culture inspire play? And this one is a lot more obvious. Uh, it's sort of a lot clearer for us to see. So uh, just some examples. And again, a lot of these are from uh, Hoys and Hus books. Uh, games of chance are associated with divination. The Wheel of Fortune is literally based off, uh, sorry, the Wheel of Fortune uh, um, TV, uh, game show, uh, that's what it's called. Uh, and it's funny here, I actually have, it's a picture of um, EA's or Ubisoft's game based on the Wheel of Fortune game show. And this game is literally based on a tarot card which represented luck and was itself used in games of divination. And this idea of the Wheel of Fortune itself is a meme that can be seen again and again, for example, in the casino roulette wheel. Um, in sports, fencing originated from dueling, which is itself a sort of game that originated from war. And some might trace soccer back to a game for training soldiers in ancient China. Toys are awesome and terrifying to me. They recreate the adult world in a cute and safe way. Uh, games might be viewed as a sort of degradation or infantile. <laughs> Infantize, I can't say the word, infantilization of adult institutions. And I'll come back to this example a little bit later because I think it's so interesting. Um, child development, uh, not something I'm super familiar with, but something that's super important when you think of uh, the influences that play has on culture. Uh, video games really took this idea of cultural representation. So sorry, earlier we kind of saw a culture being represented in these toys and in sports and, and all these other institutions or games rather. Um, and video games took cultural representation to somewhat of a, a literal extreme, um, right? That you have, for example, this game Civilization VI that is based off civilization, Grand Theft Auto based on um, our ideas of cultural violence, I guess, or whatever. Uh, and I'm also going to say here that rather uh, maybe it's time we stop thinking about representation. We can even, it might be better to think of video games as cultural sim simulations or even cultural virtualization, right? Especially in the case of something like Second Life, where uh, the idea was to virtualize a lot of our interactions. And even what we're doing right now can be seen as cultural virtualization. Um, and there's certain game like qualities to a, a Zoom meeting or a Zoom virtual conference. These cultural influences are not, just, are not just symbolic, but also systemic. So in the bottom left, we have Monopoly, um, which is the iconic example of a game about capitalism. Although I should point out, I think it does neither a good job reproducing the symbols nor systems of capitalism, but it is iconic. <laughs> so it's, it's just a bad game. Uh, modern video games do a much better job of it. Capitalism undercuts many modern video games, uh, both in very specific mechanics that support capitalistic economies, uh, such as player run economies in video games, uh, trading in settlers of Catan, um, uh, you know, farming in Farmville too. <laughs> uh, and then also it's, uh, you know, the underlying liberal, neoliberal values uh, um, undercut a lot of these games as well. Um, and it's kind of funny to think, like when you're playing Farmville 2 Country Escape, to be honest, I've never played this game, um, after you're playing Farmville 2 Country Escape after a long day of work, just so that you can do more work, 
uh, in this game, right? So that you can win at this game. Um, seems a little ridiculous to me. So now I want to introduce the magic circle. Um, it's a first, it's a term, it's a term first casually mentioned without definition by Huizenha, um, and later made concrete by Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman in their book, The Rules of Play. So the magic circle, um, it's a, it's a, a concept the, that delimits the space of play. It separates the virtual from the real world. So for example, uh, within a game of chess, the pieces move according to their own rules and have their own meaning. And outside of the game, it's just a bunch of wooden figures on a board. Nothing is stopping you from flipping the table, um, but you don't because you honor the space that's defined by the magic circle. And I think the reason why Huizenha didn't go to define the magic circle uh, in, in detail is because its meaning is intuitive, right? That we as humans can distinguish between what we're playing and what is not. And that magic circle kind of encompasses that idea and you can really say it and people will know what you mean. So Roger Kalewa defines six qualities. Um, well, it's still worth defining the magic circle. Uh, Roger, Roger Kalewa um, in Man Playing Games defines six qualities of play. And here I'm going to use play and magic circle rather synonymously, right? Where the magic circle defines the space of play. Uh, so the first quality is it's free or not obligatory. Players are free to come and leave as they play. You can always stop to play, not play the game of chess. Um, it's separate from the routine of life. Uh, number three, it's uncertain in that the outcome is not known. Four, it is unproductive. Wealth may change hands, but nothing new is created. Five, it is governed by its own rules. And six, it involves make-believe that confirms for players the existence of imagined realities that may be set against real life. But the magic circle is a tool that allows us to study play and not distinguish between what is play and not play. So we begin with an idealized notion of play as defined by Roger Kalewa, and we look for exceptions. Um, as a starting point, let's first realize the boundary of the magic circle is permeable. We already saw in an earlier example that this, um, that uh, we already saw an example earlier when we look at the relation between play and law. Uh, here we go. We saw, <laughs> we saw an example of this earlier when we looked at the relation between play and law, that in archaic society, laws were arbitrated through competition and maybe there was some, you know, and maybe there was some association with div divinity or truth, and maybe there wasn't. Um, in present day society, this is still the same if we consider the court as a sort of magic circle. And at the very least, uh, we can, you know, the court proceeding has some of the qualities of play. In this picture, we see that uh, we have conflict from the outside, um, you know, whatever, whatever got brought to court. It gets transferred into the magic circle of court where there's a contest, which is the court proceedings. Um, where some results are obtained, right? And then we'll pull the results back into the outside of the magic circle where we have the judgment or the resolution. Uh, and if this picture looks familiar, that's because we saw it before already. Uh, in our earlier example um, with uh, blockchain, real-centric blockchain, uh, real-centric video games, um, capital and data flow across this permeable boundary. So now this line here, uh, separating the real and virtual world is also the boundary of the magic circle. Uh, in this case, it's interesting, we have an explicit way to transact across the boundary. And this exchange gives precise measurability and gives integrity to the data. So through the reductive power of e economics, uh, exchanges between virtual and real world currencies, in fact, help us understand the distinct narratives in the two spaces and how they inform each other. Um, so in both the previous examples, we, we start with some real world concept, uh, transfer them, transform them into the magic circle, we'll play with those concepts, and then we'll transfer the results back out. Now I can't help but compare this to a technique that's commonly used in mathematics, where we take a problem in one area, say the reals, uh, transform them into another area, say the complex numbers, and we'll operate on them there. And then finally, we'll take the results and transfer them back, uh, in this case, back into the reals to get the results that we wanted. Um, but this is, oh, actually I have one more example. So one more example to illustrate how cultural exchange 
happens across the permeable boundary, and this is back to the example of toys. In this picture, we, say, we see cultural values being encoded in toys designed for kids. Kids will play um, these cultural, so then this goes into the magic circle in the form of toys, and kids will play and learn with these toys, and they'll develop an innate understanding for the cultural values that are encoded in these toys. Right? And this process to me is incredibly powerful and terrifying. For example, it can be used to perpetuate gender and beauty stereotypes, and they can also be used to teach kids uh, narratives about diversity, inclusion, and representation. Um, for example, in this uh, apparently uh, recent uh, Hasbro Barbie set, which I think is kind of awesome. Not to excuse Hasbro from all the other things they do. So we see that that, uh, the, the boundary of the magic circle is permeable. Let's, let's keep going, let's keep de deconstructing this. If we think about it more, we can see the magic circle is perhaps not so well defined. Video game addicts have difficulty leaving the space of play. Uh, stock markets have all the characteristics of games of chance and are very institutionalized into our real world economy. Uh, notably, nothing new is produced. And here you might argue that the efficient allocation, uh, sorry to go back, uh, one of the qualities of play remember is that wealth can be exchanged hands, but nothing new is pr produced. So you might argue here that efficient allocation of resources is productive output. Uh, While well, this only strengthens my point that the magic circle is not so well defined, in this case, we have some concept realized in the play space that actually has real world implications. Coming into the present day, digital culture undercut by late capitalism, uh, the line gets even more blurry. Um, digital culture virtualizes experiences, making them um, more game-like than ever. And then late capitalism commodifies experiences, giving them a measurable fiat value. Now, actually, uh, the picture you saw earlier is a little bit misleading. misleading, looks more like this. And even this picture is wrong. Really what I'm trying to say is that we don't even know uh, where the magic circle is anymore. We don't know where play begins and where it ends. We don't know what is real and what is played, right? And while there's so much to discuss here, I thought this Nancy comic teaser kind of encapsulates all of it in one picture. So with the cultural shift from representation to simulation, uh, it's harder to see where the boundary of the magic circle is. This fact is second nature for people these days who spend much of their lives in virtual spaces. From the professional gamers competing in seven digit prize pools to the influencers who meticulously craft their virtual personalities as if they were real, uh, to the real retail investor playing stocks and lurking on our Wall Street bets. Um, this idea of representation to simulation in our culture is an idea by John Baudrillard. Uh, uh, they write, our society has replaced all reality and meaning with symbols and signs, and that human experience is of a simulation of reality. Now, notably, Baudrillard wrote in the 80s and was referring to images created through media culture. And this is even more true in our increasingly virtual culture. Notably, we can now be both consumers and producers, which give us more agency in play or more direct agency in play. So some important points. We, don't, we do not need to ask how we can use play to improve culture. Instead, we need to understand that the development of culture is play. With the increasingly blurry boundary of the magic circle, play plays an ever bigger role in shaping our perception of reality. And finally, uh, with highly isolated and powerful platforms of play, we can be deliberate about how we shape culture through play. I actually think there's one more here. By understanding that culture is played, we acknowledge our own agency in the matter and that it is a necessarily collaborative process, right? And I really feel like this rings with some of the values of uh, radical exchange. So while my earlier proposal for a world-centric blockchain game is pragmatic as a playground for, for radical markets, it does not come close to fully expressing the power of the relation between play and culture. Uh, generating data on radical markets is just a hard value proposition, perhaps to get some ICO money or whatever, um, and use that, uh, you know, use that money to conduct these uh, social, experience, uh, social experiments in a space of play that might be used to benefit people. Um, 
for the full picture, uh, <laughs> for the full picture, imagine a new generation of players who have tried and tested new forms of radical markets in virtual spaces alongside many other innovations made possible through play. Just as digital communication has become second nature for us already through play, so too will these new mechanisms for social organization. So let's be, you know, going off what I was saying, let's be very careful not to reproduce corrupt values uh, that underscore systems we aim, we aim to change. There is no substitute for diligence, self-study and criticality. Um, many of the most popular video games have neoliberal undertones, as I mentioned already. Uh, most massively multiplayer online games, for example, have fairly rigid criterion for success that can be gamed uh, impartially by a talented player. And while all these games, including the one I proposed earlier, do offer room for counter narratives, for example, through role play or collaborative governance um, or hacking or whatever you, know, you wanna do in there, uh, the fantasy is still most readily interpreted through a, a neoliberal rules, i.e. the singular hero who succeeds in a fair world through their own talent. Um, and actually largely the reason I came to the thesis, the thesis presented here is upon self-reflection of the games that I was making uh, what impact they were having, and most importantly, why I was making them, right? I used to be a very uh, individualistically driven person, capitalistically driven, um, and that, you know, kind of deconstructing that helped me, helped me come here. And I also think this is a challenge that everyone in radical exchange is intimately aware of uh, and needs to tackle. A radical exchange was largely made possible by blockchain, um, you know, in the terms of the interest and funding that was there. Uh, but the values that underscore RxC are very much opposed to the neoliberal values that undercut much of blockchain. So as a final observation, um, play is the process we use to arrive at new truth. It is how we discover and build a new better reality for ourselves, a reality that could not be previously imagined. And to me, not previously imagined is crucial. It underscores the necessarily collaborative aspect aspects of play. And this is one of the core values of radical exchange and democracy in general. Um, and I guess here, I just wanna give a shout out and say it was really nice to see these values echoed in a lot of the talks yesterday. Um, I especially loved hearing Mei Chan Lee talk about uh, GovZero in Taiwan. Uh, and I couldn't help but see the playful aspects uh, of what they're doing out there. Okay, so we went from something very pragmatic to something very theoretical in this presentation. Uh, and my final warning even suggests that the pragmatic solution I propose may just reiterate existing neoliberal narratives, uh, which we're trying to grow away from, right? That I'm already using terminology like ICO, um, you know, player interest, et cetera, whatever. Uh, so to help bridge the two parts of this presentation, I have just one last thing to share to help illustrate how blockchain exists in this wonderfully blurry and terrifying space between play and culture. And I hope if you aren't familiar with blockchain, you've at least been exposed enough to the terminology to see some of the irony and potential here. Interleaving each new chain in ICO is a complex, dynamic, and emergent web of new relations that play out like a game. Each chain or exchange is a portal into its own world. Each white paper is like a character sheet outlining what role the organization aspires to play. Each enthusiast, developer, trader, or investor is an independent agent trying to collaborate and compete in the space. And that's it for my presentation. So we have some time for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. It's, it's, um, it's amazing to be pointing at such a, this blurry line as the, um, something to, to, we can see more clearly now. Um, what is standing out to me is the, um, when you define magic circles um, and one of the qualities being of, a, of play being that it's unproductive, um, that nothing new is created. And I'm wondering how to parse this when um, you talk about defining culture as a form of play or playing, um, leading to the development of culture. 
um, is this like, um, is the elevation of play uh, that you're describing, is that coming from like trying to make it a productive uh, uh, aspect or is this, um, I'm working with this contradiction from, from uh, listening to you speak. Um, that's an interesting question. I guess I hadn't thought too much of what uh, Roger Kalar really meant when he said unproductive. And that was, I think, also um, one of the qualities of play that uh, Hoisenha wrote in, in their book as well. And, um, you know, I, I guess I can't help but think of productivity in a, uh, I think probably their use of productivity really meant in a capitalistic sense. Uh, and if you read through their arguments in both of the books, right, that they see play as incredibly productive in terms of creating new culture. That was very much the thesis um, of, their, of their paper, right? And I guess maybe back when they were writing um, that, uh, that productivity in the capitalistic sense was, was more clear, right? Because there were more needs to be filled, whereas now we have a lot of our day-to-day -day needs um, already met, uh, at least in first world countries, right? And that we can then look at the productivity of uh, culture of, um, you know, uh, allocating resources in the case of economics um, and whatever else it might be uh, that we're doing. So yeah, I, I think uh, play is, is very productive and um, maybe that's probably what they meant when they, um, what they meant when they said unproductive, but also I guess, you know, towards the idea of breaking down the magic circle, breaking down the barrier of the magic circle, that's, that's one of the qualities that becomes kind of confused, right? Because now we are being productive that the, the cultural things that we're doing definitely have their values, uh, even if it's not represented in some materialistic object. Right, right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna draw a few questions from the audience. Someone uh, anonymous, anonymously asked um, that you talked about, you briefly mentioned, mentioned Futurki and seemed to have an opinion on it and um, perhaps to open that up further. Can you expand on if you think it's, if you have a, um, yeah. judgments on it? So I, I love the idea of Futarchy, uh, and this is because I'm a huge believer of the efficient market hypothesis, um, even the strong version of it. And the reason I'm a huge believer of that is because I'm a huge hater of the stock market in general. And it just, it's just so amusing to me um, that, that the stock market is, is entirely random, if you believe in the efficient market hypothesis, right? That there's nothing, they can, there's nothing you can do to game it. Uh, and Futarchy kind of, uh, Futarchy relies on, uh, but it's also like a really interesting uh, result, uh, which I, I suppose I, I can't really do a, a good job explaining. Sorry, the efficient market hypothesis says that um, the value of a stock represents everything, all the known information in there, right? That uh, you can't look at pr prior patterns because all that has been folded into the current value and it just behaves as a random variable. And the strong version says that even inside traders can't do anything. Uh, can't do anything about it. And it's a fun hypothesis that's sort of probably not possible to prove or disprove. Um, and so, so, but, but by that logic, the uh, efficient market hy hypothesis says, if you believe in it, then if you have something like a prediction market, uh, the prediction market um, actually accur rep accurately represents the probability of some event that might happen, right? And from there, uh, that can be used as a way to do way to do governance because it accurately reflects the probability of people's desire for something, say, right? And the issue with that, and the reason I kind of make fun of Futarchy is because um, it's, it's measuring for probability of outcome. It's not measuring for human well-being, right? And we're all here to maximize human well-being, not maximize um, likelihood. And so I just don't think the values of Futarchy align with what we're actually trying to do. A really good point. Yeah. Um, can we move away from the inevitable futures that we um, are speeding towards like uh, ecological disasters? It's not, it's not something we want to accelerate towards. So um, yes, uh, another topic that you briefly touched on, I think the, this um, question points to uh, do you have a proposal on how to reduce biases in games? Um, and one popular uh, example being uh, games with violence and war and war and cars for men and um, how that enforces a lack of diversity. 
Uh, that's such a great question. I'm so glad someone asked that. Um, and this kind of goes to my point that like a lot of the modern day video games undercut neoliberal values, um, which you know is, is to me in a lot of ways synonymous with, with patriarchy and also very much reflected by the fact that the vast majority of game developers are, are men. Um, you know, and I myself as a game developer. So this is this is actually the only reason I was about to like just stop making games because I was sick of all of it, right? But uh, because of my kind of own gendered upbringing as kind of just like a dude who played games and realizing how problematic or how privileged that was, right? And both how much uh, my space of play excluded others and how much that I had been missing out by isolating myself in the space of play, um, not being exposed to all these diverse perspectives that could help uh, help help inform me and so so that the, the answer to the question is kind of like uh, a yes and yes you know games are super problematic and we need to start thinking about how to incorporate how to represent more voices how to let more pe people express their voices in games and I'll be honest that um, at least the first half of my presentation really didn't speak to that right that more than likely the people playing my real centric a real centric blockchain game like that are probably going to be men just because that's you know the the demographic skews that way already and you know i had some hacks to kind of like like this is something i love doing although i'm not sure if it's actually that productive it's like okay well like i see as an opportunity to get all this money from you know powerful dudes or whatever and get in the hands of people who who are underserved right so let's let's make a program where i airdrop or or create grants where 30 percent of the tokens go to like uh, female gamers or something like that right and does that actually, you know, you know, I like doing stuff like that. And I think it can be part of the solution, although um, it doesn't necessarily speak to actually, <laughs> actually addressing the systemic issues um, behind it. And so the second half of my presentation kind of like, I hope in terms of uh, when we think about play uh, to not just isolate ourselves to, to just thinking about games, right? But to continually, I mean, to me, that's very much the spirit of play, play is to continually broaden the things that we're speaking to, that we're playing, the ideas that we're playing, to introduce new um, diverse identities into what you're playing with and figuring out what you can learn from there um, is, is very much, yeah, I, I mean, for me, that's very much the spirit of play. Uh, again, I wish I, I spoke to it more in my presentation, uh, but I didn't, but that's definitely something I believe in. Um, so we're rounding up to the end and I suppose um, it'd be nice uh, if, do you have ways uh, projects that you're integrating these ideas into now or um, some ways of incorporating this into um, from the theory to uh, to a, a form of play? Um, well, the answer to that question right now is a no. And one of the reasons I'm presenting now uh, and here is hoping that others will, will take upon these ideas and do it themselves for various reasons. Like me at my point in life right now is not the right time for me to go make this real centric blockchain game. Uh, and in a lot of ways, kind of my own values have sort of sort of shifted. You know, I grew up playing a lot of games that are very much undercut by neoliberal values. Uh, and, and it's funny because now I've been able to reflect on that and I, I don't really enjoy playing those games anymore. And therefore it's quite difficult for me to go uh, make a game like that. Um, not to say that I won't ever make games again. I, I need to do some more soul searching in that regard. Uh, right now I'm working at a company and that makes a very successful game that's played by a lot of kids. And I'm, you know, the reason I'm there is to kind of uh, see if I can get more conversations around diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity, especially getting more women both developing and playing games. Um, and that's kind of my focus right now. So yeah, I really hope someone else goes out there and, and makes a um, make something inspired by my talk here. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks for sharing your insights. Um, is there a preferred way that people who um, resonate with what you're speaking about reach out to you? Uh, yeah, I really didn't think about that very hard. Um, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me by email. Uh, you can visit my website. I, I, I hope my name is Googleable, but I'm not totally sure about that. Yeah, I had a little yeah, trouble. I'm sure you Maybe. can find out my inf contact info if you try hard enough. And please do reach out. OK, thank you very very much. Um, I think we'll close out this session and um, see you next time. Great. Thank you, Whaley. Thank you.